Yo, 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 yo. Welcome, welcome back here for the another beautiful um, Stay Black series. This is the Stay Black series. You know, this is a series where every Tuesday evening, you know, me and hopefully a host of friends just discuss issues to do with black people, black consciousness, and just various things to, to do with race. So um, hopefully we'll have some guys coming in and out and so forth. But you know, what? whatever it is, man, you know, we're here to have an open transparent conversation and i think that these conversations that we have every tuesday i feel and and i needed and the key thing about this is that these conversations yes there are they, they, this is a here to primarily for black people and here to help black people and help especially the young black people and help the black consciousness but this is also for all sorts of people that i think these conversations everyone can learn from you know so um we will be hopefully expecting a few guys in here normally these are about four hours but, but because um there are some things i've got to do later this evening we are going to try and condense this to about an hour and a half so an hour and a half talking focusing on this topic and we may delve into another topic after now so we just have to just see how things go and things how things progress throughout this program so um so sam are you there yep i'm here all right, cool, cool, cool. So, so, so the other guys are, are are coming in then over the course of the hour. I'm gonna try to get them in, but if not, um, it's just me. Okay, okay, cool, cool, it's fine. So let me just kick kick, kick things off, and then I will um, kick it over to Sam. So look, um, I have a dream. You know the famous speech by Martin Luther King, and this was a speech that we had to study in school. And I remember when I was sitting down and then, you know, there were, we had to read through this speech and so forth. I remember as I was reading through this speech, it didn't really connect with, with me. Okay, we got a boy dead and in there. So, so when I was, I was reading the whole I have a dream speech, it didn't really connect with me. I was like, okay. And at the same time, I was thinking that, why are we learning this speech in this class? And why is this teacher teaching me this speech in this class? Well, I know that this teacher that's teaching me this speech is probably racist. You know? So it just it just felt confusing. And it felt that learning that speech just stood out like a sore thumb. Because again, we're learning stuff about racism and all this kind of stuff. But it's the, the speech never, ever connected with me. It just never did. And I, I could never connect with the speech of what Martin Luther King was saying, you know. And I think, you know, in hindsight, maybe what I've, I've, I've come to realize that, you know, that speech was what it was. It was a dream. It was just a, a dream, which is cool. Dreams, oh. are cool. Dreams are cool. But it essentially was a dream. Now, what we'll obviously get into the Martin Luther King that we are, um, that that the media shows us with regards to the real Martin Luther King, especially the Martin Luther King towards the end, you know, of his life. Talking about rep, rep, reparations, I mean, far more militants than than he was during during the earlier years. But my my jump off is this between these two is um, is how we were never really taught anything about Malcolm X throughout my my school and. Every single thing that I learned was always from Martin Luther King. A certain, a certain Martin Luther King, not the full pie, not the full picture, a certain Martin Luther King. And the same thing with Malcolm X. Even if we didn't hear anything about Malcolm X, we were shown a certain part of a Malcolm X, not his full, not the full picture of, of Malcolm X, not, not the full 360 image of Malcolm X, just... So, Certain things were picked up from Malcolm X to make us perceive him in a certain way. And this, what I've always found fascinating, and as me growing up, I was looking at America, but really the, the, the world and so forth is, and this is maybe where this is a, a good thing to kick over to you guys, is how do you allow your oppressor to tell you how to... Um, revolutionize how do you look to your person to tell you which kind of re revolutionary figure to follow and how to revolt because that essentially is what has happened because there is not because every time i see these things with you know protest happening racial things 
everyone just points to Malcolm X. So sorry, sorry, everyone just points to Martin Luther King. Everyone just shows these Martin Luther King speeches every single time, like clockwork. It's a Martin Luther King speech. And the thing about it is, this is that you know, this is where people are not really thinking. You have to use your 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 your, your brain. Your oppressor doesn't want to lose their privilege. Your oppressor doesn't want to lose their power. They don't want to lose their power. This is, whether you want to call this a, a cold war or an un, un, unspoken war, there is an ongoing war for racial power, racial superi so, superiority, because human beings are so messed up, we're, we're so messed up as, as a race, we don't understand what equality means. We can't achieve equality because we're so sick in, 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 in the head psychologically. So really, there has been an ongoing one war for racial superiority, which you know the, the white man has, has pretty much won and, and dominated. So when you know for the fact that you have this ongoing war that is happening and they are fighting to maintain their throne on the top of the mountain, <laughs> how is it that they have somehow successfully told you which revolutionary leader to follow and what part of his teachings you should follow. Because I'll say again, which is what I started, the I have a dream speech is completely and utterly useless. That's not true. Wait, That's no, not no, no, true. No, no, no. Let me just land. Let me, guys, I will, this is a debate. This is a debate, okay, let me just land. Let me land and I will give you to you guys too. This is just from my view. From my view is, you see, I'm a guy that I think you have to deal with reality you have to deal with how things are. Then when you know how things are, then you can now go and delve in. Because for me, Martin Luther King made far more useful, far more piercing, far more realistic, far more effective speeches. But the speech that keeps on being popularized, that keeps on getting promoted, it's, it is of no use. And also, especially, especially <laughs> when you look at the build-up to that speech, what led to that speech, and maybe we'll get into how farcical the whole match of Washington was, <laughs> and how that was that so-called match and that so-called revolt and protest was actually it, it was actually all set up and it was green lighted by the people you're fighting against. Then you then when you understand the, the the context, then that makes you pause to 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 think. But before I, I give it over to Sam and Daniel, my thing with the whole with with Malcolm X and, and what has been so sad and unfortunate is we haven't been told the fullness of the man we've not been told the fullness of the man all i got told growing up and how i got viewed growing up was this is just this angry angry man because even when i was through school and everything because i already knew about malcolm x but looking at him, so, I king. so when i was in school i said wait a minute why are we why do we keep getting told this much with the king why not this malcolm x and all i got about the malcolm x was he's dangerous he, he was crazy. He was like a racist. This was a very dangerous, dangerous man. But that is the oppressor picking out what is convenient to tell the particular narrative because I'm all about truth. The truth, the whole truth was Martin Luther King realizing that no one, these guys don't give a damn about your dream is, uh, let me start actually reassessing what the hell that's, you know, um, I've been teaching. If you look at the fullness of what Malcolm X was saying, was okay. Maybe what I said it was a bit of an extreme, but still, this is the, the, this is the reality of what the white man is. This is the reality of the world that we're, that, that we're living, and these are the human rights that we that we want to deal with. So, I want to kick it over first to Sam before I give it to Daniel. So, Sam, so in your view, let us deal with this thing first of all on a macro level. What is your personal overall view on Martin Luther King, and your overall view on Malcolm X? So. Martin Luther King is a visionary. I mean, the thing is that his, the way he saw things, and I mean, the way his speeches were, were laid out, and the reason why they focus on that one I have a dream speech is because it's a vision. It's, a, it's, an accomp it's something that you want to achieve. The big thing about it is that you, um, the big thing is that you, is that you want to get, it's where you want to get to. It's not where, you can easily achieve that. It's not something that you can that will get that you will get to easily. It's something that it may not, and even to a point, it may not even be something that will be achievable ever. 
we may go we may go extinct as a human race before we get to that to that level. But the thing about it is that it's still it's still a goal that we're trying to achieve because as human beings, our whole point is that we want to be better. We want to be better. Now, okay, 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 real quick, Sam. So, do you think that it is a realistic aim? for any black man to aim for supreme equality 100% in this world? Is that a realistic aim to aim for in your life as, as a black man? I think, I think if you set the right point, if you, if you set the right points, yes. Now, if you're talking, now it depends on what you, what you deem or what you believe is equality because equality means certain things to certain people. I mean, there is like, pure equality, but there's also certain things because when you, because I'll even, I'll even go further. I'd say that there is no, as far as with people and with things because of our situations and because of, of who we are, or what we do, or because of our physical condition, there would never be true equality because if you actually had true equality, it wouldn't be fair because I mean, think about it this way. If somebody's poor, they're not equal. If somebody's injured or somebody was born with a birth defect, they're not equal. It's a matter of it's a matter of getting it as close to equal as we can, balancing the game as much as we can. It's like playing a, a, a game or something, balancing everything, putting everything um, to a point where there is a certain level of equality. So it's fair. Okay, so actually, before I go over to Dan, let me just read. So, really says, have you watched Who Killed Malcolm X? Yes, I have. Very crazy. I'll probably do a review on it a few days after, I mean, in a few days, but yeah, crazy, crazy documentary, crazy documentary. So, Daniel, so again, overall view, before we go into details, overall macro view I didn't, on Malcolm X. Yeah, I didn't go into Malcolm X. I wanted to talk oh, about... Oh, oh, sorry, 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 Sam, go for it, Sam, go for it. Okay. Yeah, as for Malcolm X, Malcolm X was an interesting one because you're right, I... I mean, I learned, I didn't learn much about him in school, even though I grew up in like a mostly black and Hispanic neighborhood, but like the, I did learn about him offhand. I learned about him from my parents. I mean, I watched the movie, the the movie from Spike Lee, like multiple times. But I mean, apart from that, I've, I've read his memoir as well. Um, what I will say though, is that Malcolm X, um, Malcolm X is interesting because Malcolm X, while he does come off, I mean, if you're if if you're coming, if you're looking from the outside in, you'd see this guy. You'd think he's a hateful, angry man. But if you're looking, for, but from the inside, you can tell the truth about Malcolm X is that he's really just trying to get us organized, both internally and externally, because his big his big focus. Because when he started, he was um, he was a common criminal. He was a common criminal. He had a he had his regular slave name. And as soon as he went to Malcolm X, he basically completely, it completely changed them. It completely changed them. And then from that, it essentially made him into a person who's into a person who understands that, that there are these people outside oppressing me. And then on top of that, there's also people that there's that, I mean, that we as a community have to get ourselves more organized in a in sense of, of multiple ways where it's like, being able to defend ourselves, being able to to properly establish our businesses and economy, and concepts that we had before, but just trying to like really put them more in perspective. Okay, so let me revert to Dan. So, so Dan, in your view, on a macro level, general view on the Martin Luther King, general view of Malcolm X, as macro as I can make it. Yeah. Um, Martin Luther King was a reformist. He was an inside agitator. And Malcolm X was a revolutionary and he was an outside agitator. And so so why wouldn't you um, assign the term revolutionary with Martin Luther King? Because he was looking to do work within the system. Malcolm X wasn't concerned with the system. If you're trying to change the system, you're trying to reform it or change it. A revolutionary isn't concerned necessarily with what happens inside of the system. He's concerned with changing it or re overturning it, revolting against it. That's the term revolutionary. So I see Malcolm as an outside agitator who 
he he could affect the inside just by his presence. But overall, he was a revolution. He was going to become a revolutionary. Um, even the Nation of Islam, in its sense, is a kind of revolutionary group. But Martin was a reformist. A radical reformist at that, but somebody who still wanted to work within the system. So that's as broad as I can make it. Okay, I think that's also a good way to to even jump off, and I think that's actually a perfect way to sort of decipher between both of them, you know. And now this is now where we see the the key thing because I've just been looking at the live comments here. I am not here to be like, oh my Martin Luther King was nothing, and Malcolm X is much better. No. You know, um, both of them were extremely, extremely useful. And both of them did extremely amazing work, 100%. But what this discussion is about is how both of them were, were portrayed by the media. And let's try to di dissect what both of them were about and whose methods do you feel were most effective. So I want to now come first with Martin Luther King. And that's why I started with the whole I have a dream speech, which is, reforming yourself within the system. Now, if you guys have listened to the previous weeks and everything, this is what I've, I've always said. Pause, Double H, but before we get into I Have a Dream, when was the last time you read it or listened to it? Um, bec oh, years ago, because we... Okay, now, this, this, this becomes an issue for me, just as a premise of having a discussion, because... It's labeled I Have a Dream because of one section. So if anybody knows anything about the history of the I Have a Dream speech, and I'm flying off the seat of my pants here, feel free to correct me in the comments. But the first <laughs> 2,000 words or so of the speech, however long it is, is basically calling America to the carpet. It's basically saying, you guys said in the Declaration of Independence, we are all endowed from, by our creator with certain and alien certain inalienable, inalienable rights and among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and he basically goes to explain that america has defaulted on its check or it's it's defaulted on its promise and they have come to washington to collect the check that's exactly what that's exactly what he said the other thing too about M about mlk is that can i like, land though wait 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 wait, 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 wait let's so, let daniel land let daniel so land so my point is he gets through kind of explaining that America has kind of been bankrupt in the promises that it had kept or that it had espoused in its formation. Um, and then a very key point comes in the speech where you don't hear this on tape, but everyone, who, everyone who's there kind of acknowledges this, that Martin Luther King always had this thing about a dream. This wasn't the first time he spoke about his dream. But his speech wasn't going to be a, this. This wasn't going to be an "I have a dream" speech. It wasn't written down on the paper. But Mahalia Jackson, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Mahalia Jackson, but she's a very famous gospel singer. Probably she's probably you, you, you know how like uh, they call Aretha Franklin the queen of whatever, or James Brown is the uh, the king of soul or pop or funk or rock or whatever it is. He's a king of soul and a king of funk. King, king of soul and the king of pop, right? Mahalia Jackson is the queen of gospel music, okay? So she sang at his funeral, all that kind of stuff. She's, she, shout, she shouts from the crowd, hey, Martin, tell them about the dream. Tell them about the dream, Martin. So if you listen to the speech, he starts a sentence, and then he pauses, and then he kind of recollects himself, and he goes back into something that he's been saying, you know, since the early 60s, I suppose. So what, what, what happens here is if you read the speech without the I have a dream section, it's actually a quite profound and radical dramatic speech that you would read and you would think, hmm, like this guy was actually quite more critical and he had a very poignant and elegant way of speaking that kind of made it not seem as impactful. But if you actually sit down and deduce and read the words, minus the I have a dream thing, it's actually quite staggering. Oh, oh, now, wait. now, let me, wait, land, wait. let me land, let me land, because you, you brought me here, so let me land. <laughs> but what, what has happened, and I guess I'm sure this will transition to your point, is what has happened 
is they took that section and it that has became that has become the most famous part of the speech. So the reason why I asked when was the last time you've read it is because I don't want you to come with the same paradigm of misinformation or just a lack of knowledge on the subject that everybody else has come to. Because if you only think I have a dream is about I have a dream that my four little children will be able to hold hands with white people and all this kind of stuff. If that's the only thing you get from that speech, that means you've been brainwashed to never read it. All you've been told is Martin Luther King wanted us to all get along and he wanted us to sit down at the table of brotherhood and all this kind of shit. Not that it's shit. It's actually, it's, it's a nice ideal as Sam was saying. It was very idealistic. But if you never read the actual speech and you never read how we get there, which he outlines that America needs to get on its shit and do what it needs to do for black people, then you've missed the boat. Wait, actually, let me just hit this because it's very clear here, because it's very interesting what you say that, but let me, let me, let me just, because I, I want to ask you something specifically, then I'm, I'm going to go to Sam. So Real Deal says, MLK was 25, Malcolm X was, was 23 when they started their civil rights movement. People that criticize ask, what have you done at that age besides play games? Oh, no, no. I think that is that is a very crazy thing, which is that these guys were extremely young when they were doing what they were doing, which is why, again, this anti thing of like, oh, Martin Luther King didn't do, do anything. No, 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 no. Because they, are, they, they aren't normal 25 year olds. Yeah, yeah. Like, but Martin Luther, Luther King, King Martin Luther no, 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 but the thing though is that it is a thing of like, guys, if you're in your 20s, yeah, you can't just be like, oh my gosh, still those guys are anomalies. You, this is what a 20 something year old could do. And remember, guys in their 20s, I'm sure I was, I think, Dan, you're obviously coming into 30 right now. I'm in my th 30s, <laughs> Sam, you're in your 30s. My thing is, your 20s is when you're the most vociferous. That's when you have the, the most passion and, and fiery within you. So there's nothing that says, oh, I'm 23, I'm too young to do anything now. Nah, that's crap. So I want to so ask something to Daniel, then I'm, I'm going to go back to Sam. Mm -hmm. So Daniel, so, so it's interesting that you say that because when we studied it in, in class, the way that it was presented to us was just the whole I have a dream thing. Well, this is this is in wait, 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 wait. This is, I want to answer your question. So, yeah, 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 the way it was presented to us in our class, because remember, this is England, countryside, everyone's white, white teacher, and so forth, <laughs> you know. So, so, the way that we were it was presented to us, where maybe we learned the speech, but the focus of that class. And what's we, and the whole focus on the discussion of that class was on that whole I have a dream thing. And that was just taking so in my mind as a early teen was, oh yeah, that's pretty much what he said, really. So now my question to you is this, and then I won't go to Sam, but my question to you, Daniel, is this. If that part of I have a dream wasn't in the speech at all, what becomes of the speech? It's is it as popular? No, of course not. I'm thinking. Well, what happens is when the speech was very popular after it was said, I think if probably if you could pull up the Wikipedia page or something like that, it'll tell you like J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI were like, yo, this is going to be the most dangerous Negro in America. I think that's when that started. <laughs> so like whatever COINTELPRO operations they were looking into Dr. King, it started that because they realized the power that he could have over people, just the way he spoke and his tone and trying to get people together is always gonna be a cool message, especially after what happened in Birmingham, like two, three, four months prior. The reason that it happens like that though, is because we'll, we'll get into King in later life, but when someone dies, they lose control of their narrative, right? Like if, if I die, everything that I've ever written, everything that I've ever said or tweeted or whatever the case may be, is now in the hands of whoever reads it. So I think America realized if we go back and we rebrand Dr. King, not as the radical revolutionary who wanted to have, who wanted to, de to um, redistribute wealth and do all these things that he got to in 66, 67, 68, we can actually kind of make him into a kind of universal figure of American idealism and the quintessential kind of boiled down version of American idealism in terms of unity is that stanza in the I have a dream speech. It is the idea that, you know, people in Mississippi will be able to join hands and sing together and all that kind of stuff. 
So King, in his death, has been co-opted by the American government, by the West in general, and has been used as a tool to kind of, uh, you know, when everybody, de- whenever somebody, whenever somebody does anything violent, <laughs> to go, well, Dr. King said we should all be peaceful and nonviolent and this and that. But, but, there to call them. He's basically there to quell the masses because I mean, honestly, yeah, yes. like, I don't know if you guys look at a lot of media, but there's a lot of conservative, even alt-right media. Alt, and if you guys know anything about alt-right, alt-right pretty much is code word for white supremacist. Those dudes use this guy as a talk. They use him and use excerpts from him. I mean, mainly the I have a dream so that they can basically shut people up, be like, okay, you guys are talking about about that, about starting something or about even like, even if it's as little as a protest or as little as like talking against something that's not a system that's not correct. They'll bring up that and basically say, shut your mouth. Right. Um, but this, but this, but, 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 but King's, King's, King, King's purpose in his life was not to be an arbiter of black people's morality. He had his own nonviolent philosophy because he was a preacher and he believed in the Bible and the redemptive power of, you know, the spirit and all this kind of stuff. But King's purpose was calling white people to the carpet because they would actually listen to him. And, you know, they white people wouldn't listen to Malcolm just because of the way that he came at them. But they would actually listen to King. And King's purpose during his life was holding white people's feet to the fire and telling them that you guys need to do better. And if you don't do better, then the problems that we see in the American ghettos and the American South will continue to, will just continue. And so that was his purpose, but he, but now he's been co-opted into like, if you do anything even slightly outside of the social uh, order, black person, here's our King quote. But they won't tell you the Harry Belafonte thing where he was like, you know, I'm worried that I'm bringing my people into a burning house. They won't tell you all that stuff. But, you know, I'm talking a lot. So go ahead. It's right here. Sam, go for it. Sam. Yeah, I mean, pretty much the other thing, too, is that with um, with MLK, I mean, a lot of people see see him as just this like as just his figurehead. I mean, figurehead in regards to um, he he's supposed to be this talk of of nonviolence. People also don't understand why he went with nonviolence. Um, and why even, and if you go back, why Gandhi went with nonviolence as well. The big reason for that was because is that when you're going up against an overwhelming force and you're trying to exist, you're trying not to get your people wiped out. It's the, it's the only tactic you can do, use to basically to gain equality. I mean, we talked about it before. I mean, if you want to get any form of rights or any form um, anything like that, there's multiple ways to do it. Civil unrest is one of those. The other one is basically going straight to, um, um, I mean, the real deal brought it up, Nat Turner. If you know what, Nat Turner is a, is a very interesting part of history. That's, that's basically the opposite, where you basically fight your oppressors, but in the end, they outnumber you, they outgun you, you pretty much end up dead, and anybody that's left on the side, they get they feel the repercussions from that. So hmm. it's um it's it's a little bit of food for thought. I mean, Nat Turner, I get the anger, but the thing about it though is that like with that, when you talk, when you look at it, it's just not, it's something that's not feasible, especially when, especially when you're like a minority, when you're a minority in a massively overwhelming country and you're trying to get some level of rights and they haven't and they haven't killed you. Now, double H, double H, double H. Do you do you want me to link this back to Malcolm? I can I can get us there if you want me to. <laughs> you know, because I want to just because yeah, I want to just say something with, with Malcolm because and this is what how I want to. Whenever you want Malcolm, let me know because I can get to, I can get us from nonviolence to Malcolm in about three minutes. No, 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 but just but because I wanted to ask a question about it because there's something that's you raised mm-hmm. specifically with the with with the Bible, and this is a thing of edu- education. And type of education. And for me, I believe that there are two types of education you can have in life. There is the system, school, institutionalized education, and then there's the life education. Now, Martin Luther King, more so than not, had the more school, institutionalized education. 
Malcolm X had much more of the life education of experiencing things, education. Then obviously he then sort of um, taught himself by, you know, writing down every word in the dictionary, reading books and everything when he got into prison. But most of his education, a wealth of its pre-prison was just experience, living right into the world and actually being one-to-one and having these um, racial experiences with white people actually taking in, oh, this is how these, these, these guys act. So from that sense, what is more what is more useful what what kind of education is more useful the kind of education that Martin luther king had because you because you because there are pluses in both of so i wanted to hear what you guys think about how these guys came to be what would they be based on based on how they educated themselves yeah. so what type of education is more useful the kind of self-taught useful to what U- that- useful in what way or just what would you mean which one's better which one to your in terms of what they are preaching about in terms of revolution racism racial truth what type of education is more useful the education that Martin Luther King had or the one that Malcolm X had because well, from my point of view Martin was never talking revolution he was just talking very drastic reforms so, whether it's reform revolution or so forth based on what they were trying to do what is which which education is more useful? Martin's. Martin's. Yeah, I I agree too. Martin. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Expand. So, Why? Okay. So if we just want to go into Martin Luther King himself, he entered Morehouse College at the age of fifteen. So he passed the entry exam to college as a fifteen-year-old. He graduates with a I think a philosophy degree at nineteen. Then he goes, and that same year when he graduates at 19, he becomes an ordained minister. Then he goes to seminary school in Pennsylvania, Chester, Pennsylvania. Um, An interesting fact, there in Pennsylvania, he meets and becomes romantically engaged with a white woman who he wants to marry. His dad tells him no. And perhaps that is now the the kind of seed that grows in him that, hey, we we, we all want to come together. Um, so it's funny how Malcolm and Martin both have their kind of white women stories, but he graduates from theology school. Then he goes to Boston where he meets Coretta Scott King. He gets his doctorate in uh, philosophy or theology, whatever it is. So by 25, this guy has his master's, his doctorate in philosophy and in edu- and in the, um, uh, theology. So this informs the worldview of, hey, like nonviolent action is probably the most applicable, not, and as I guess Sam touched one of the aspects of just like, if you're just a general in war, you kind of have to know the numbers, but King is not, he's not just coming it from a kind of tactical, it's, it's not a tactic to him, it's a philosophy. So people like Stokely Carmichael, even Malcolm X probably to an extent, they would have they would have accepted nonviolence merely as a tactic. If we can use it as a ploy to gain an objective, fine, we'll use it. But if someone hits us, we will hit them back <laughs> because to them it's just it's just tactical. It's just something you do. It's like putting two strikers up top when you need a goal. It's just something we're doing for the moment but it's not something we are going to do for all time. You see, with King, nonviolence was a philosophy, immovable, unshakable. You couldn't stop him from not having nonviolence. Like Tiki Taka. Yeah, it's (laughs) it's, it's like uh, uh, Martin Luther King is sorry, okay? He's playing 4-3-3 no matter what. uh, Malcolm... He's like uh, maybe like Mourinho. He'll play four two three one four three three four four two. Like you know what I mean? <laughs> wait, 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 what's called by any means necessary. Exactly. Whatever it takes to win that game. Whatever it takes to 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 get the three points. That's what that's what Malcolm was on. But for King, I but the 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 reason I say King's education or his background is more useful is because he can understand where Martin comes from or where Malcolm comes from. Sorry. Malcolm trying to understand the whole theological 
kind of ph philosophical thing. I'm not quite sure. Wait, 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 it's wait, it's wait, as wait, easy wait, for him to wait, understand wait, wait. Martin See, as it is for Martin to understand Malcolm. There's That's another question too. It's not just Martin to understand Malcolm. Martin also understands the system. Somebody actually put it in here, put it in the comments as well. Like Mart, like because in order to like really gain a, to gain headway in a lot of these cases, not only do you need allies, but you also need to understand the system. And that was one of the big advantages that Martin Luther King had over Malcolm X. And that's why you have that whole insider versus outsider. I mean, because think about it this way. Martin Luther King throughout his, I mean, he met up with what, three, pre he met up with two presidents? He met up with- uh, two, yeah, with, yeah. Kennedy with and Johnson. Presidents. Kennedy and, and Johnson. He was, and he was one of those guys that was in their seat that was- that was pretty much in their office when it came to black. He was the, the go-to, he was Johnny on the spot, the go-to guy whenever it came, whenever they wanted to talk to black people. But that and that's the thing. I mean, like in a lot of cases, whenever you're trying to make massive change socially, you need somebody on the in, you need people on the inside and people on the outside. And that's gonna be how it always is. And you're also gonna need allies that are, I mean. Oh, okay, okay, so wait, yeah, so. So, so Dan, you, you you wanted to veer off into the whole Malcolm. What was X. I going to say? I, I I forgot it. <laughs> oh, okay, 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 okay. Let me just take this thing. So, Real Dude says, "U.S. will not teach about Marcus Garvey or Nat Turner." Hell no, no way, no no no, they, no way will they. So, wait, school systems are all all messed up. So now this is also how I wanted to introduce it because you said something about how you feel that Malcolm X. So, so you feel that like Martin Luther King can understand Mal Malcolm X? No, I'm, I'm not saying that Malcolm can't understand Martin. I'm saying if you're asking me who can understand the other one better, I think Martin can probably more easily understand Malcolm than the other how, way around. How? Why though? Why? Just because of Martin was raised in Atlanta. He went to school in Pennsylvania. He went to school in Boston. He had the Northern experience. I'm not sure that Malcolm ever lived in the deep South for any amount of time. I'm sure he lived in Michigan, which it could be that Detroit could be that, but Malcolm was Martin was living in Atlanta in Montgomery, Alabama, but then also had the Boston experience, which is a Northern city, the Chester, Pennsylvania experience, which is not quite rural or urban, but it's still North. So I just feel like Martin had a bigger kind of breadth, of things that he could kind of pick from, but it's just that he was tied to nonviolence. So. so, so okay, so so, so now, so this is sort of like my in, sort of with Mark Mal, Malcolm X, and again, I keep on have to reiterate, reiterate this. This is a discussion about both, and I know the person that resonates more, more with me, but this is a this a discussion on both. This isn't a competition between both. So the thing with Malcolm X is. And I think the key thing you raise, the Bible, the Bible, ordained minister, church, that's institution. And Malcolm X, all, um, he always rebelled against the kind of image the Bible tries to portray and the kind of racial environment that the Bible tries to create. And I've also, also said this many times again, Nigeria, growing up in Nigeria and so forth, that there are certain hypocrisies with regards to the church and the, the Bible, specifically with Africa and so forth. So my thing with Malcolm X is this, because you see, Malcolm X, when you look at his his, his life, which is why I just say it is so important to read, read the book and it's such an amazing book. And it is, it's, 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 it's so messed up that people haven't told his full story because it's an amazing story. Because Malcolm X is, when you look at where he, his trajectory, they're full of imperfections. And just speaking to myself, I can connect more with someone who is imperfect than someone who is perfect. I can connect more with, oh my gosh, this person, oh yeah, those, I understand those mistakes. Martin but, wasn't perfect, by the way. What is like, that? Martin wasn't perfect. We can get into his imperfections if oh, we no, want. No. But but you see, you see, 
how things are portrayed towards you. You see, I learned about, I think, I remember years ago about how he was with different women and so forth. These are things that aren't shown or taught towards you. The image of Martin Luther King is one of perfection. Mm -hmm. This is the leader I want you to follow. But you're oppressing me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're oppressing me, but Mr. Oppressor, who do I follow? Him. This is this is who we want you to follow, and we're gonna clean up his image. Forget about all this stuff. This is the perfect image we want you to follow. Boom, go. And always, and and that in itself is problematic. But the thing with Malcolm X is the way he's presented is wait, look at what this guy used to do. Look, look at how this guy is is preaching. Look at his 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 contradictions. Look at where he goes here. He goes there. He 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 goes there. But the thing about it is, all that matters is the end point. That's the key thing, because. Again, if you want to liken this to football and and so forth, this is why I say, you know what? Dribble as many times as you can. You may make mistakes whenever you you dribble. You may get dispossessed. But if at the end of the, the day you, you get that goal, you be the man that get that goal, it is worth those mistakes because all those mistakes all build up to experience doing that. Ah, if I go left this way, I can beat him because I've gone left and right this way five times. Boom. And Because once you now reach, reach the end goal, that's what we want is the end goal. That's goal. So for Malcolm X, all those mistakes that he 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 made, all those things that he did, the kind of journey that he went through, was all necessary on reaching a key end point. And the thing about Malcolm X is, this was a guy, <laughs> you know, this was just a guy, and all the stuff that he was because whatever you talk about right now is all linked to what you did 8, 10, 15 years, years ago. Everything is interlinked. So who he was, this guy that was the face of the nation of, of Islam, this amazing speaker, and, and, and so forth, he didn't completely change after prison. Yes, he made a change, but he wasn't a completely new new person. There is still something about that hustler, about that guy walking, walking with those pimps that is still in what you saw there. And those things... I believe were very important in forming the, the kinds of things that he was saying and where he was coming from. So, because again, when you look at the kinds of things that he was saying before he even went to prison, that's the key thing. Before he even went to prison, the kinds of the observations that he was making and the kinds of things that he was re revealing about the truths of racist white people were, were very real and very important in forming, in my view, a far more effective change. Because again, I go back to this whole thing of like, what do you really want to achieve? And that's the, the key thing. Do you really believe you can achieve equality? And I think somebody even in the live comment said, okay, what do you mean by equality? I say equal opportunity. Based on your um, achievements, this is what, what you have. And I said, you can never have equality in this system because they'll, 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 never, they'll never allow you because this system is built on inequality. The, the system that white people have built, especially in America, it's it's it, inequality is needed for the system to work because once you have equality, the, the system it's the system no longer ex exists. So this is why Malcolm X was trying to be much more revolutionary and say no no no. Be, again, you have two things: either you 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 go to war against the system, or you have to radically build a new system or something totally new. So. Then let me bring in you to you towards your view on Malcolm X then, as opposed to Lord the King. <laughs> um, I think as as much as we consider Malcolm kind of or Martin rather, um, kind of a pragmatist in many ways, kind of like his whole tactical thing. I think Malcolm was probably even more pragmatic in the sense that <laughs> Martin had the idealism of, you know. It, Martin had victories if you if you really think about it like in 1963 like the Birmingham campaign was successful which led to the 1964 Civil Rights Act which led to the 1954 um, 1965 rather um, Voting Rights Act after what they did in Selma so like Martin was like he was big. He was like a big time kind of thing. like he had wins. As Sam said, he was really he was speaking with presidents and he was getting pens from the act signings and all that kind of stuff. And then he goes in 1966 to Chicago and 
he goes and he lives in the in the ghettos in Chicago, and he's like, "Whoa, all the gains that I got in '64 and '65 and '63 to an extent, they do nothing for people that live in the northern ghettos." Because I think he came to the conclusion. Well, he, he I don't think he said he came to the conclusion that all of the things that he fought for were free. So you know. You let somebody eat at a at a lunch counter that they weren't able to. You let somebody ride a bus when they weren't allowed to, or whatever the case may be. Like those are just free things. You just do them to do them. And in some ways, that even helps the white economy because now you're allowing even more patrons to go into their white businesses and spend their black money there. So then he realizes it doesn't cost anything for black people to vote. You just let them do it. But now when I go, like the Watts riots happened in 1965, he goes to LA, he goes to Chicago in 1966, in 1967, I think he's in Harlem, and or just New York, and he's, I think, as he progresses, he's understanding that the problem in the South is different than the one in the North, and Malcolm had the already, had already had the understanding of what happens in the North because that's where he was from. So he lived in Boston. He lived in New York. He lived in Detroit. Um, I'm not quite sure if, how many times he went to Chicago, even though I know the hub of the Nation of Islam is there. So he had the understanding of the northern cities already. So the conclusion that Martin comes to and by, like, by the time we get to 1967, 1968, obviously he's not going to go with the whole black power movement that started by Stokely Carmichael and the Black Panthers are now emerging in, in Oakland and all those kinds of things. Martin would never have gone for that just because the gun – is to him immo immoral like you're not gonna fight immorality with more immorality that's not his that's not his that's not his jam but i do think he came to the understanding that i think this malcolm guy had a point where i go to chicago and he told one of his people that i saw more racism and hate in the faces of the white people in chicago than i did in mississippi think about that and think like okay so a person like malcolm x lived that life all the time what do you think that's going to do to somebody's mood rather than just kind of coming from the Southern context of racism where it's kind of all out in the open, it's overt. But when you live in a more covert mm. racist society, but then you add on top of it, the poverty and just the desperation that that causes in people. And then when you have them all huddled together in the same spaces and there's just this, I don't, I, it's hard to describe a ghetto in a sense, but you guys can probably feel what I'm saying. It's just, it explained, Martin's evolution explains Malcolm's just being in a way that's very uncanny. It's just like, so what, where Martin was going was where Malcolm was at the whole time. But just Malcolm had that thing in him where he was like, yo, if you, if you slap me, <laughs> if you stick a dog on me, you're, you're it, I have the right to shoot the dog. And any two-legged dog that sends the dog to me, I can shoot him too. Like that was Martin, that was Malcolm's vibe. Martin would have again, Martin would have never gone for that. But that sentiment, I think, explains where Malcolm, where Malcolm's head was at for basically his whole life. So that's that's how I would describe how I feel about about Malcolm. All right, Sam. As far as Mal as far as Malcolm X, I mean, the thing about it is that he we the big points I take away from him is what I mentioned before, which is is how we how we wanted us to restructure how the black community operates. I mean, and that goes off of the point of like spending money in store. Um, what he said, spending money in, in, in white stores and stuff like that. I mean, if you think about it, he was he was conceptually an, a segregationist. It's just a different way by than how it was normally how it was normally implemented. It's because when you think about it, when you have when you have those black owned businesses and you have all of those all of that infrastructure that's already there. Really, it was just a matter of getting the infrastructure to be better and attracting black customers and white customers and having that and having that income come into the community rather than go out. And that was one of the parts. Um, and then the other thing 
concept of self-defense because if you know if you knew when early on in his life he was based him and his family they were they were attacked multiple times by the by the kkk burnt crosses all of that um i think in this day and age he would be a he was really one of those types that was that if he was around today he would basically be emphasizing that everybody should that every black person should get a gun and that mm. everybody should defend themselves i mean he's the the picture where he's in the window with the long rifle, like. <laughs> that's, epic. that's an epic picture, by the way. Yeah, yeah it's dope. Actually, let me just hit this. So, Mrilde said, the bigger issues is who are the leaders of today? Jigaman and Lil Wayne. But I want to I I jump in on that, but you're- a problem with having leaders, by the way. Right. Because the thing about it, though, is that, here's what I think happened. Um, from the 1960s, after both of those, both X and, and MLK got killed, uh, there's been a, I mean, a lot of things have changed and like there's been a lot of complacency. It's kind of like, if you think about it, like how like it went from, like even if you talk about general American history, it went from World War I, World War II, these big wars against the clear enemy to a smaller war, to small proxy wars. I mean, that's what's going on right now. I mean, like, pretty much the KKK and, like, white nationalist and white supremacist groups, they relatively invisible, tried to blend into things. While, I mean, the, the new movement is, the, is Black Lives Matter, which is more, which works more in cells. Uh, one of the big things, too, about that as well is that, is that I think there's there was a mentality between back then and now Panthers got broken up by Coin Intel Pro and like the government. Um, it was pretty much like the mentality in the black community that if we have a leader, that there's a very high chance that that leader is going to die, that leader is going to be assassinated, that leader is going to be killed, and the organization is going to be torn apart. I think that's why, like, even like Black Lives Matter stays the way it is because they're not trying to, because they're trying to be decentralized so that it's harder to. It's really hard to take to really tear others, but they're branch leaders. So, if, like, even if even if that one branch leader is gone, there are other branches, or mm. and so on. I mean, that's one thing I would think. Yeah, it's, I mean, like in in the '60s, you knew who to shoot, which is kind of morbid in a sense. But Medgar Evers is the lead chapter in the NAACP in Mississippi. Okay, someone goes and shoots him. Mar uh, Malcolm X is the leader of the N of the N O uh, the Nation of Islam N O I. Well, well, no, 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 no. In 1965, he's the leader of the uh, the United yeah, African American uh, Unity something. I'm, I'm forgetting the acronym. The O A A U. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. He's he's the leader of that, and he's going to Africa, meeting with all these leaders. Shoot him. Um, Martin Luther King is the leader of the Southern leader, the S C L C. Yeah. Really bad with I, I know the acronyms, but okay, shoot him. Uh, Fr Fred Hampton is the lead, um, is the leader of the Black Panther chapter in Chicago. Shoot him, you know, Huey Newton, leader of the Black Panthers. Yeah, put him in jail. What you, you saw what happened with uh, Angela Davis in California, where they were trying to like assassinate her essentially through the legally. Like, when you have people who you know what they do, it's easier to target them and it's easier to take them out. So, so actually, I want to um, bring in. I, I want to bring in Africa now. It's interesting that you went there. I want to bring in Africa. So, to my understanding, again, the guys in the live chat, say me I'm wrong, wrong or not. The only time that I believe Martin Luther King went to Africa was for Ghana's Independence Day inauguration, and he was invited as one of the special guests to be part of the, the kind of inauguration of um, Ghana's independence and so forth and i think he says that was actually what that was actually a very critical point in his thinking with regards to seeing how an african country could gain independence and so forth um i think that was only really prominent time he actually went to africa but obviously you know about a year or two before his death malcolm x went on this kind of african voyage he went to nigeria he went to ghana he went to he obviously he went through egypt and so forth and he was really pushing towards um breaking the kind of chain and the gap between 
Africa and African Americans and, and, and really letting people in Africa know about the plight of African Americans. And, for me, and I've always said this again, and I'll keep repeating this is that I always say that, you know, it is, I think that if you can, every African American should at least go to Africa once. Just go there at least once. Because psychologically, mentally, it is needed. And I don't and I think many African Americans don't know how much they need it for their psychology until they actually do it and actually do so. But let me come to Sam first with this. Do you think that it would have been maybe more helpful for Martin Luther King to have extensively gone to Africa in the same way that Malcolm X did and really have extensive discussions with African leaders in Africa, talking to African um, students and people in Africa, and that would have, that would have helped his mm -hmm. cause a lot more, or, or you don't think it's, it would have been helpful? So, <laughs> so pretty much that's, I'm, I'm just gonna straight up say no. I don't think it really would have had that. This is controversial, but I think, it, I don't, because African issues are not American issues. Now, here's the thing it would do, though. It would give him more perspective. It would give him more perspective, more understanding. How did, though, is that American ish black issues in America are way different from black issues in Africa or black issues anywhere else in the, the diaspora. So, like, mm. and that was one of the big things about it. Because, yeah, it look, if you look from the surface, everything may look the same, but when you look in the complexities of things that go on within with drastically different basically where we where we stand how our economics are how things with um with education situation medical situation everything it's just there's just too much and what i would say is that it would give you an under um an understanding i'd probably say it would give you a vision of where there is no, where there is, where there is no, especially, I mean, during that time, a lot of, during the time of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, a lot of countries in Africa were just gaining their independence from, independence from, I mean, Europe, European colonizers. So I, I'm not exactly sure it would have, it would have had that much of an effect because I was thinking, I was about to say it would give them an understanding of how, how a, how a all black nation functions without, without white leadership, but you can't, but during the sixties, it wasn't, that wasn't the case. At least not except for Ethiopia. Hey, Daniel? What was the question? If you could rephrase it for me, please. It's basically, so um, do you think that if Martin Luther King had spent time as extensively as Malcolm X did, that would have been helpful for his movements, his no, tactics, no, alter his no, tactics no, or strategy or so forth? No, because as I said at the beginning, Martin Luther King was ultimately a reformist. And in ref you don't need really outside help in order to reform a system from within. Okay, okay, okay. So you don't think that he would have been turned into much more of a revolutionary if he had had these extensive discussions with those African leaders? He it wouldn't have changed his viewpoint. You can't be a nonviolent revolutionary, Double H. Those two things don't mix. So no, he uh, it it might have broadened his scope, and he might have had maybe had a good relationship with a Kwame Nkrumah or Jomo Kenyatta or Kenneth Kayundo or Julius uh, Enyere from Tanzania. Like fine, he might have had a great relationship with those guys. If he gets there before the, you know the Belgian and the, and the U.S. take him out in the early in the late 1950s, maybe he has a great relationship with uh, Patrice Lumumba. Who knows? But as far as that relationship's usefulness to the plight of African Americans in King's mind, it doesn't help him. Because what is a relationship with Kwame Nkrumah going to do to help the Civil Rights Act of 1964? It's not going to help you, really. Like, it's just a friend. Um Malcolm, on the other hand, if you're enacting a revolutionary pan-Africanist mindset, if your father is a leader in the Garvey movement and your mom's also a pan-Africanist, and that's kind of the 
mentality that you've been brought up in, that you understand that all of us are Africans and we're all fighting the same white supremacy, whether it's in South America, North America, Africa, Europe, Australia, Asia, wherever it is, we're all linked through the singular oppression of the same group, then you do need to establish links with people in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Algeria, in Egypt, in Kenya, in uh, South, not South Africa at the time, <laughs> but uh, wh wherever there's an element of black people in power, it is a good thing for you to establish a link there. Because I think Mar Malcolm's ultimate goal was establishing some form of an African American base in the United States and having them be able to trade much like what Garvey did with the Black Star Line. And, you know, you get your ships, you go to Africa, you get the resources, you come to America, you can produce things, sell them to white people, and you create your own independent system outside of the American context. But you can't do that if you don't have an international base or relationships with which to start. So that's why Malcolm was going on his world tour, essentially, because people were interested in his ideology. And all of those early African leaders were all Pan-Africanists and African socialists. So it just matched up perfectly with, with what he was on. So, but yeah. So, um, I mean, I'll, I'll take this in, but another thing I wanted to bring it, and I think it's very interesting that you brought that distinction, Daniel, which is the revolutionary and the reformist. So remember, there's something very interesting that Malcolm X said in his book, um, which is that, um, no matter what, again, I'm, I am paraphrasing, I'm paraphrasing, but his point was, no matter what, the white man will always feel an air of superiority over you, whether consciously or subconsciously, he will always feel that he is superior and he's better than you. By if you want to him. integrate into his system, how could he not? What's right, say again? If you want to integrate into his system, how, how could he not feel superior? That's so yeah, so basically, which is why I'm coming to the point of like where this is his system. Key points, his system. So my question is, is it realistic? Was was this a realistic goal for Martin Luther King to truly reform the system? And how much could he truly have reformed the system if let's say he had let's say lived for 10, 20, 30? 44 more years. So I'm going to come first to Sam. How much do you think, realistically, Martin Luther King could have reformed the system, and to what extent could it could it have been reformed, and where and where would African Americans be with regards to how much he could have reformed a system that is owned, ruled, um, and engineered by white people, Sam? I think he could have. I think if he if he had a bit more time, he could have actually negotiated. A, a realistic reparation plan for Black Americans. I know some people may be, maybe maybe wait wait wait, 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 which is what? Give me a bit more detail. What would that have been? Go into a little bit more more detail. The the thing about it is that I don't really know how the how it was going to to come out, but essentially it was going to like some of the concepts of it was going to be that anybody that was a that was born of a slave, so like because there were accepting Black in, Black African immigrants, so like Black African immigrants or Caribbean immigrants wouldn't have, wouldn't have got a, got a piece of that. That would have just been children of slaves. Children of slaves would have, I mean, descendants of slaves would have got it. And I think it was something they were doing. They were going to try to not exactly forty acres and a mule, so so to speak, but but basically putting basically putting that money in in the individual's hands and in infrastructure. And at that time, with the with the depreciation, I think it would have maybe been maybe like a billion or two, because right now it's at fourteen reparations are right are sitting right now at fourteen point seven trillion dollars, which is which is two, which I think currently we're sitting at a twenty one trillion dollar, um, I mean GDP, so that gives you perspective of how much of how infeasible reparations are but i think that would have been one of the things that he really would have pushed them 
he would have really would have pushed the needle on and actually would have accomplished. Um, okay. Daniel? I think in, in 1967, King, and let me land here. Um, in 1967, King gave a speech called Beyond Vietnam, like um, time to break the silence, basically. And a lot of the young college campaigners, um, like a Stokely Carmichael and those kinds of guys who were young and who were college age, were like, bro, we're getting drafted into Vietnam like at a disproportionate rate. I think if you've watched the Five Bloods recently, I think they yeah, said something yeah, yeah. like 33%. Yeah. So one out of every three soldiers that was in Vietnam was black. So they're like, how can you be this nonviolent kind of guy and not speak out against the Vietnam War? That doesn't make any sense. Like if you're nonviolent, speak out against American violence. And King was kind of convicted in that sense. So on April 4th, 1967, exactly 365 days before he died, um, or yeah. would 1968 have been a leap year? Perhaps 366, who knows? Point being, he gives a speech at a place called Riverside Church in Manhattan, New York, a, a church that now has a wing for him, I believe, and they offered him the pastoral role of this place. So it's thought that after this campaign that I'll get into, that King would have successfully done that and then he would have just gone to be a pastor because he did 12 years of civil rights work in the South. You're just kind of rolling the dice and he rolled it one times too many. But so he gives the speech and in the speech, he talks about the militarization of the United States. And this kind of sets him against Johnson. So like Lyndon Johnson is kind of against him after the speech, but he talks about how can I tell these young people not to be an advocate of black power and not to use violence when my own country is the biggest purveyor of violence in the world? I can't. So he goes into how do we have people who are homeless in places like Chicago and New York and Los Angeles when we're spending billions of dollars for a war in Vietnam for what? The domino theory? It doesn't make sense. So he goes into this and he kind of lays out the plan for what he wants. There's another speech that he gave at Stanford. It's called uh, The Other America, where he was like, you know, it's a, it's a, what did he say? He said, we're often told to lift ourselves up by our bootstraps, but it's a cruel jest. Oh, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. yeah. Suggest to a bootless man that he should lift himself up by his bootstraps. And he basically then lays his further economic plan which eventually becomes the poor people's campaign in 1968. And what they wanted was um, they wanted more low income housing. They wanted King was a proponent of like the guaranteed annual income. Um, and there were other like little, not little, but actually like quite expensive programs. I think something like $40 billion in this poverty package that he was campaigning for. And what he understood was this wasn't just for black people. So when Sam talks about reparations, I don't know if King would have fought for reparations necessarily. He um, actually but, did but, talk about it, I'm, I'm, No, I'm sure he did. But this last campaign that, that, that he did, this was, yo, we need poor white people. We need Native Americans. We need black people. We need the Latino community. We need all of us together. And we're going to go to Washington, D.C. And we're just going to camp out in Washington, D.C. until we get what we want. So, and it actually did happen, just that he wasn't alive to, to participate. But that was King, that was where King was going, you know, um, which I was. Too, because one thing as well is that, like, was that kick, was that, that was another reason why he inevitably got targeted. Because that time, that during that time from the early 60s, I mean, actually, from the late fifties onto the onto the seventies, into the mid mid late seventies, there was a huge witch hunt by by McCarthy and by J. Edgar Hoover, basically looking for like communist, and that's why like a lot of people targeted him as a communist because he was talking about like giving all this stuff to the poor, uh, basically giving equality because almost pretty much anything that that talks about basic general income, I mean, um, guaranteed income per year programs to the poor that's usually considered very leftist and very socialist, socialist. yeah it's socialism and socialism they basically tie that with communism so 
<laughs> I mean, that was that was one of the and because as far as civil rights alone, they weren't going to target him. I mean, they they would target him off of that, but it wasn't just that. It was the socialist. It was a socialism bit too, where they really were like, yeah, let's let's get this guy. Like I said earlier, man, when he was asking for things that didn't cost any money, like let them vote or let them eat at the lunch counter, it was perfectly fine. But once he starts trying to get into the pockets of America and he calls out Johnson, who was fighting a war that at that time, the of course, the youth were always against the war because they were the ones who were more likely to go. But the vast majority, I would say, of the country was still on this kind of like, we need to fight communism. We need to stop communism from spreading in Asia, which was the domino theory that, you know, if one country falls in Asia, the rest are likely to become communist. And they were obviously in a Cold War with Russia at the time. So when King comes out and says, yo, my country's the biggest purveyor of violence in the world, what I think happens is Johnson, who was obviously Sam brought it up earlier, King and Johnson were, you know, in the same rooms, they were doing bills, they were, I don't I want to say they were friendly, but they got they they did business together, so to speak. What I think happened was as soon as King kind of spoke out against the United States on in that speech in Beyond Vietnam, I think whatever protections that the United States government was probably giving King at the time, they probably took that away. That's that's my assumption is that you know, King was probably targeted all 12 years of his um, civil rights career. And as long as he was kind of in the pocket with what the government was talking about, whether Kennedy or Johnson, they probably had levels of protection for him. Like, you know, all right, but no, go ahead. So, 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 I mean, so basically last 15, 20 minutes or so, let me just ask, yeah. cause I also want to ask one round of question for you guys. So it says, I should ask Daniel and Sam, give me three solutions for obviously U.S. blacks, blacks in U.S. So again, let me, okay, let me give it to you, Sam. Then. So what solutions moving forward do you think black people can, can be given to black people in the U.S. to sort of su succeed or move forward? I'm going to make, I'm going to put this in three recommendations. Recommend, recommendations from the top, recommendations from the middle, and recommendations from the bottom. Recommendations from the top, that means the elite, the, the, the black elite, the rich. Um, they really need to put they really need to put more money into um, I mean, put more money into property, more money into ownership, more money into communities. And when I mean communities, not just like putting a putting like a million there or a million there or a million there to like some organization. I mean like actually directly buying businesses and buying stores, buying apartments in, I mean, in the inner city, because those are going to be what, what leads to, um, I mean, that's going to be what leads to like making places better and more and really at really getting that ownership of the neighborhood. Then, then there's the middle for the, for black middle class. I got to honestly say that keep doing what you're doing. Keep plugging away at it because a lot of people don't talk about it, but the black middle class is doing all right. I'd say really the only thing with them is ownership. The only other thing I would add to that is ownership. Just keep buying, uh, just keep buying property. Uh, we're rate like the um, the black home ownership rate has raised, I think, about ten percent in the past 15, 20 years. It went from something somewhere in the low thirties. Now it's in forty. It's at forty five percent home ownership, which is pretty good. But we still, but we still got a ways to go. We want to get over fifty percent. Next thing would be, next thing would be everybody, everybody at the at the bottom. I mean, like lower classes. I mean, really, the the big thing is, I'm just gonna straight up tell people, yo, use a condom. <laughs> yeah, use a condom. If you, uh, if you got a kid, fucking take care of him. Like, really, that's it's simple stuff like that. I mean, because the way to stop the the way to stop perpetual, perpetual cycles of violence and like, just like criminality, it's fucking like is just I mean, it's to take care of your kids and be there. You don't. There's a lot more than that, and there's a lot more thing, more things on the external that need to be taken care of, which we're working on. That's uh, 
police reform, uh, equality at the workplace, really talking to banks and education systems about about selections for loans and for schools. But as far as inter as far as internal, those are the three ones that I would use, and those are to address directly those three classes because those are the three main classes that make effects here today. Okay. Daniel, what about you? <laughs> I mean, I, Sam hit on some of the some of the things I would say. Not necessarily the wear condoms part. Um, do what you do. Um, <laughs> um, man, I don't know. I don't. It's more like a plan. I don't know, like if it's necessarily three solutions, okay. but it's the idea of. I'm, I don't know where I would start. I mean, because you need the money to start the businesses, but it's like. Black ownership, I think, is is quite key, um, but it's it's the idea of it's difficult. I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to think of like profound solutions. I'm like, damn, the problem is kind of deep, bro. So it's like, no matter what you do, you kind of need some level of cooperation, or it won't work. Um, I think the basic thing is just education. So own who teaches your kids or have some level of influence on who's teaching your children. And on top of that, not everybody needs to go to college. Mm. So the idea of, you know, trade schools and, you know, become a welder, become a plumber, become an HVAC guy, become a, um, an electrician, those kinds of jobs I think are key. There's a reason they don't teach them in high schools anymore, especially like in, uh, black areas. I think that's done probably somewhat intentionally. Um, that way people are kind of subjected. Hey, either you take this loan debt or if your grades aren't good, you're on the corner, you're in jail. Now you're in a private prison. We make money either way, that whole kind of thing. Um, so I think having some level of control over black schooling, number one, a black child's more likely to take on learning and feel an affinity for education if they're being taught by black people. It just is what it is. Um, my mom teaches in schools and she always talks about, you know, that we need more black male teachers and things like this because the students that she teaches don't really connect with like the 27 year old white woman who really doesn't give a shit about them. So that thing is is key. But then I also think like if it's a public school system of America, they're not going to really do anything in your best interest, are they? Because I'm pretty sure they're fine with it how it is. Um, but yeah, those that is my probably main thing is education, trade, trade jobs. And then once you build that kind of um, base, then we get into black banking, black businesses, Make sure your dollar bounces, Claude Anderson kind of stuff. Um, okay. So we're just going to take a few questions here, and then we're going to be right out. So this is an interesting one. So from Mr. It's Good to School. Can black people become powerful if they're in Europe or U.S., or do they need to start from Africa? I love that question. Let me just start with this, and then I will send it over to you guys. So I did a course in international marketing some years ago one of the best teachers I've ever had. This guy, I think he was from Zambia. He was either from Zambia or Zimbabwe, Mr. L Lloyd Lushinga. I even remember his name. Best teacher I've, I've ever had. Amazing teacher. And he taught me, this was like a one-year course on international marketing. And he said to me that the future, the big future is going to be green technology. He says that maybe 10, 15 years time, the big new thing that's going to be the most profitable thing that everyone will be looking for is green technology. And that is why China are putting their hands in Africa because China are looking about 15, 20 years ahead. And Malcolm X even mentioned China would be the, the next big empire. But yeah, so China are right in Africa. And I can I see it for myself. Every time I go to Nigeria, I see Chinese guys in restaurants. I see Chinese guys in buildings. I see Chinese guys in all these businesses. I see Chinese guys all around because they are putting a foothold because they know that Africa and green technology is going to be the big thing in the next 10 or 15 years. Africa is the new China. Pretty, yeah, pretty much. And, we, we, and see, I don't want to veer there 
because that's I don't want to veer off into well, no, 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 no. Well, 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 do you know what you're doing? Do you know what is happening here? Are you gonna? Are you? I don't want to get expressive, but that's what I that's mean is really deep rabbit hole. What, what oh. I mean is like you, you know, if you flip up, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's like in England, but in America, if you if you flip the back of anything, it's made in China, made in China, made in China. Why is that? It's because the the means of distribution in China, it's easier for people to, it's cheaper for people to make stuff in China and then ship it wherever they need to go. When as China becomes more um, economically advanced and their population becomes increasingly more middle class, the people in China aren't going to want to do like menial labor. Obviously, they have a billion people, so there'll always be a working class there. But they need a place to fund the middle class in China. And I think the Chinese see the African population that's been underdeveloped, how America and the West looked at China maybe 30 years ago or 40 years ago. But the problem is there's no place, there, there will be no place for Africans to, once they become middle class in theory, there's no other place for Africans to go get their labor from. So this is like the end game, cap end game capitalism that we're almost in right now. So, yeah, so... To to your to your point, then this is what I've always said, which is why I said I think what Malcolm X was thinking about doing in terms of being revolutionary and working with Africa, I think was more helpful than what Malcolm X was doing, trying to reform a system that's what's not that wants no business with you. So yes, they're both useful, man. I mean, I, I'm not sure one is better than the other, no, unless I, I, un, unless something's overthrown you know what i mean no no, no no i've always said that either you overthrow or you create something new that's my stance and i'm not so that's always been my stance either in a way you, in a way malcolm's presence helped king because malcolm was, because malcolm to, yeah towards the end and they were like we're not trying to deal with niggas like this so let us deal with this nigga because he's see, meaning king because he seems at least like he kind of likes us a bit. And that kind of, I think that helped. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, I, so that. I mean, you got to think about it too, is that like, if you guys have watched X-Men or even know the whole theory behind X-Men, I mean, Professor X and Magneto are basically, they're basically supposed to be based off of Malcolm. I mean, Professor X is supposed to be based off of Martin Luther King and Magneto is based off of, I mean, off of Ma Malcolm X. Essentially, the whole thing is that one person wants to wants to work with people. The other one doesn't want to work with people. Wants to get his way. I mean, wants to make sure. Wants to start anew, essentially. Hmm. All right. As far as the question, though, I mean, actually, 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 actually let me because let me answer it and then I'll give it to you guys. So, my thing is, individuals or pockets of individuals can become hugely powerful and profitable in Europe or the US, as we've seen with, whether you want to look at an Oprah Winfrey, you want to look at um, AJs, you look at all these pockets of people. But as a whole, as a whole, I've always said that black people have to look at Africa. Mm. And the thing about Africa is that it's a long process because again, there's a lot of corruption, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of corruption, there's a lot of greed, and there's a lot of, and the, the power structures are messed up. But there are, improvements happening because what is happening now i can speak for nigeria is what's happening is tech there is a whole bunch of young people who are now computer savvy and into, into tech so the tech industry is rapidly increasing because like when i went to nigeria i was amazed with how yes there's still issues with power and lights and everything but with regards to the internet and digital stuff and technology things are very advanced high-speed internet Everything is computerized, boom. So for African-Americans, I just say it is, if you go to Africa, there is a better chance of you being much more affluent and and you achieving greater a greater sense of power within Africa as you can within America. Because no matter how much you succeed in America... <sighs> You know, that's what I say. So, 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 so much how much you... you how much what you, I'm not a fan of, though, Double H, is like... What? I don't want black America, and I, I include myself in this in some ways, just black people or Africans who live outside of Africa to come back to Africa with the same colonialist mindset of where they came from. So in the idea, of, 
In what sense? The idea that like an African American will go to Africa and basically see all these economic opportunities and do them, but not with a, a love for his people or her people, just with the American, the white American capitalist Exploits. mindset of there's money to be made here. So let me exploit these people once more. Mm. I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna ask you a question, Daniel. Would you consider your do you, would you consider yourself a capitalist or a socialist? I would consider myself Ooh. a revolutionary pan-Africanist. <laughs> I mean, wait, 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 I would consider myself a revolutionary pan-Africanist, which which which, which which leans socialist. So yes, okay, you're a socialist. Okay, that that explains a lot. <laughs> but, well, well, well. To to be anti-colonialist is to be socialist because capitalism was built on colonialism and oppression. So if you're a capitalist, you're a colonialist and an imperialist by nature. And I don't subscribe to those two things. Therefore, I'm only left another one option. So that's my logic. Okay, let's let me bring this in. Now this this is so thoughts on Elijah Muhammad saying he talks to Allah, which is a sin in Islam, to elevate yourself to that status since even Prophet Muhammad did not speak to Allah. Now I don't know enough about Islam or the nation. No, that was exactly where I wanted to start with. But let me, so this is all I'm going to say on this. First of all, I don't know enough about Islam to even comment on this, so I won't. But this is what I will say. Um, I won't comment, but I'll comment. Let's go. No, 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 Rec no. Reckless. Let's be reckless. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm very tactful here. I'm not going to comment about what is happening in Islam, right? No, because I, because I do not know enough about that. But what I will say is this: is that watching. The Malcolm X film, reading the autobiography of Ma Malcolm X, from what I've known about the nation of Islam, uh, shout out to Jay Electronica. <laughs> um, it's very, very. It is. It's. 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 It's always very, very dangerous when certain people have a certain power, and do not underestimate people's need to believe in something and re and refuse any opportunities to question what is this they, they believe in because they need to believe in this thing for whatever it is they are they are going through so that's probably the most that i can say is always be wary when a human being a human being just like you who bleeds like you who cries like you a human being <laughs> is elevated to so much power and it becomes a deity when they are human, just like like yourselves, because that is always very dangerous. But again, as I said again, do not underestimate the desire of people to create deities. Messi, Cristiano, um, what, what whatever things. It's a human thing, and that for me, I always feel is very very dangerous. Do you guys want to comment on this or? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> you are not right, <laughs> bro. I want to bring up a separate point, which was on the whole communist, I mean, sorry, socialist versus capitalist. The whole thing about socialism versus capitalism. So capitalism existed way before colonialism. It, that's the first thing. It's a, I mean, just like democracy. Democracy existed as oh, far back okay, as so, 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 Sam, you're a, a capitalist. Let me take it. Yeah. I'm a capitalist because, and the thing of, and here's the thing about it, capitalism. I mean, yes, it's at the expense of somebody else. I will admit that, but then again, that's only if you have unchecked capitalism. If you have unchecked capitalism, yeah, then it's going to be completely cutthroat. Uh, but the thing about capitalism, though, is that capitalism is a way that people can, people are credited for their individual achievements. That basically means that people that if I create an idea. Or you create an idea that that I it creates competition, which builds better communities. I mean, like every success. Oh, well, well, is that what we have in in practice, though? Is that what we're seeing in practice? Yeah, in practice. Like even the other thing too is that look at even more like successful socialist or communist societies, like the CCP. CCP over the past thirty years has been has pretty much been pseudo cap has been pseudo communist. I would say pseudo communist because there are some things that they practice that are in theory that are communist, 
But then again, as far as business is concerned, especially international business, they are very capitalist. I mean, the the Chinese people are a capitalist are a capitalist group. I mean, they do have socialist elements, but they're mostly capitalist. Um, same thing with um, I mean, same thing with the Russians. Even same thing with like the Northern Europeans, like Scandinavia. They talk about having all their social programs, but then again, a lot of their mid and high level stuff is still capitalist. It's just that they check a lot of guys at the top. That's really the big difference. Okay, so just to end, last point before we get out of here, you know, um, if let's let us do a what if scenario. That, that's a good way to end this thing. If Martin Luther King and Malcolm X had lived, this it's impossible. It never would have happened. But let's just create this scenario. It never would have happened because the system, the man would, or the they were, they, they, they were always going to be, be killed. But let's just see. Yeah, let's just play this. What if, if they had lived 10, 15, 20 more years, how do you think they would have affected things, and how do you think the world would have been? Um, yeah. because again, that's that is every time I just look at I read their stories, I say, okay, what if we can, what if they don't have lived? Because I do believe this is one thing I believe in, I will, I'll kick it to you guys. Martin Luther King was coming more towards the path of Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King was really seeing where Malcolm X was coming from, and Malcolm X was also seeing where Martin Luther King was, com was coming from, hence why he was saying that, you know what, I hope that these other leaders will sort of forgive me for what I said in the past because we should all be able to work together. And I, and I, and I do believe and I do feel that they would have benefited from each other's strengths. Martin Luther King's scholastic um, school institutionalized um, education and Malcolm X much more life lived experience education and they would have been able to, to blend within one another and combine into a very powerful force malcolm x may have shown martin luther king the benefits of african working with african leaders martin luther king would have shown malcolm x the, the benefits of working within the system and how you can maybe take stuff from the system and so forth so and also as i say the, the key thing in life middle ground Make the pendulum do this. Don't let the pendulum go like this. Do not make the pendulum go like this. Make make the pendulum go here. They would have found a middle ground, taking the best of both of their ideas. And, and see, 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 now the other thing is, I don't. This is the part that I don't know. I just don't know where black people would have been specifically in America or, or with regards to the world, because if they had lived and they have continued to do what they were doing and they they just have kept being alive and trying to do things, they, they have made some serious change. And I think just the climate of the world, especially the climate of, and how the black man would have been viewed, would have been very drastically different. It would be very drastically different. So let me head over to, to, to Sam. If um, they would have both lived, what do you think the world would have looked like if they had both lived? I think if both of them lived, the black community would have been in a much, much better way. I think overall, the entire like you um, landscape of the United States would have been in a much better way. I'm not saying that things would have been perfect, but I could tell you one thing. I think that gang, I think that there wouldn't have been as many gangs around. There wouldn't have been the war on drugs wouldn't have been fought as aggressively as it was fought. I think black families would have been there would have been more black families more black families around even with the poverty and there would have been a lot low a lot lower crime because there's they were basically like parents like leveling people that kept heads level because after that like there i think kind of the black community went in a little bit of disarray the black panthers tried to keep things in check for a little bit but um but in addition to that i mean there's some stuff with um i mean in addition to that, I mean, there's just some stuff that would have, I think as far as like morals, as far as like the way we, the way we advanced would have, would have changed. I still think that there would have been, we still would have been fighting civil rights to this day, but I think we would have been in a much better spot. All right. Daniel? What's the question again? Man, I'm, are you really sleeping? So, pretty if, much. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see if they had both lived. If uh, okay, I got you, I got you. Um, if they both lived, what, what, what would the world have looked look like? Um, 
not too much different, probably. If I had to guess, because King his his um approval rating in 1968 was at seven was at 25%. So his dis now in America today, King's approval rating is like above 90. So everybody loves him because of what we talked about earlier. But in 1968, before he shot, there's a Harris poll that came out. It was like at 25%. So people weren't fucking with him, man. Not back then. And it just would have gotten worse. Like, especially the longer the Vietnam War went. Um, and he starts campaigning for the billions of dollars in relief. That oh, black, people really black people would have so supported him, like, even now, beyond America. The thing is, are we saying they both live at the same time? Or if, like, if Martin gets to live... No, if Malcolm gets to live past, if Malcolm gets to live past Martin, no, that, no, no, no. that's, that's its own timeline. At the if same time. Martin gets to live 15 more years and Malcolm still dies in 1965, that's its own timeline. But if they both live together, that's a completely different thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so my, my question is that they both live at the same time. Ooh. That's tough. Because I know what happens if Martin gets to keep living. If Malcolm gets to keep living and Martin still dies in 1968, that's a very interesting timeline because you kill the person who's talking about nonviolence and you have Malcolm on the road, basically, who can galvanize the youth. And what's interesting, by the time Martin dies, the youth are already quite annoyed with the idea of nonviolence. It's why cities like Chicago and Baltimore and D.C. and um, LA, the King riots in 1968. We've heard a lot of uh, we've heard a lot about the King riots since the mm -hmm. whole George Floyd thing. Um, so that energy was already in the people, um, which makes me think if King lives, you know the 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 line is it from Batman or something? You know, die young and be a hero, live long enough. Oh, yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. King, if King was alive today, people would be calling him a coon. He would be like Al Sharpton. No, 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 no. Because Al Sharpton is not considered a coon to most people. But he's but, still considered pretty irrelevant, though. But no, but King King would have King would be out talking about probably this isn't the right way to do it. We shouldn't be taking. We shouldn't be burning things down. And because he again, he was a nonviolent person. So, oh, people, so, so you still believe that he would have still have maintained his nonviolence approach? It wasn't like I said before. Nonviolence was non-negotiable. That <laughs> he dies in Memphis for that very reason. In March of 1968, he goes to Memphis on like a whim to help out the sanitation workers. He just sees it on TV and he decides to go. He he leads a march that wasn't planned by his people, and the march turned violent. People broke in broke in the store windows in Memphis, shattered windows. There was a bit of looting, what have you, and he decides. I need to go back to Memphis in early April to have a peaceful march because I need I, I need to, I need to correct the wrong of what happened with the march that I was involved with. He goes to Memphis again to lead a non-peaceful march. He never gets to lead it because he's shot before the march happens. So his dedication to nonviolence was paramount. There's he he does not move from that rock. Because it's not simply a case of, it's not a tactical thing. It is a moral obligation based on his religion and based on his faith in God. And I suppose his hope and faith in people that once I see, once you see the immorality of your ways, you will then be forced to change. Like if I hold a mirror up to you and you look you at will, the, you will change. And, and you look at the dirt on your face, you will wipe yourself off. Stokely Carmichael kind of said it best. He said, uh, you know, King's philosophy worked with people who have a conscience. <laughs> but what happens when you meet people who don't have a conscience? And will always make excuses for what, for, 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 for their actions. Which is why I'm saying if Martin continues to live into the 70s and 80s, like I said, I think he he does the the poor people's campaign in Washington D.C. I think sh Sam was probably right, and that they get some kind of gain from that just because of the amount of people that would have been in Washington D.C. 
and his oratory skill and his ability to talk with Johnson and maybe how the Vietnam War progressed by 1969 or 1970, they would have got a gain from that. And then I think he just goes and, and becomes a pastor. I don't think he continues his civil rights work in the same way. I think he sees, yo, I put in 12 to 15 years of work and he goes and he pastors his father's church at Ebenezer Baptist in Atlanta. And every, every once in a while, he'd pop back up. Malcolm, on the other hand, if Malcolm continues to live, he's always in the struggle to this day. Like if we wanted Deontay Wilder this, he continues to go work in Africa. He continues to organize um, the OAAU and, um, and the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. And he's always kind of just anything that happens, he's you know pounding the rock, pounding the rock, pounding the rock, and making sure that, that he's mobilizing and then organizing the people around the idea of revolution and connecting with Africa. And I think that's what happens. So, okay, so, so, so in a sense, what you're then saying is that if Malcolm X had lived, he would have had a higher approval rating amongst like young blacks in America as opposed to... Oh, King. without without question. Without question. He has yep. a higher approval rating now with most young black people, I would assume. Like under... if you take like a poll of under 35 black people in the United States right now, Malcolm is always going to appeal to the young people, no matter what, just because his energy speaks to the energy of youth. Just like, you're not going to hit me and I'm going to let you hit me. Like, oh, you're, you're not going to hit me and I'm, I'm just going to take it. That's not, you have to cut, especially in today's society where Christianity and religion has kind of gone by the wayside and there are less people who are claiming mm -hmm. to be religious and more people are agnostic or whatever the case may be like or atheist that whole idea of that christian morality and that whole like nah like if you hit me i'm going to hit you back that's what it is so malcolm yeah. is always going to speak to that energy and youthful people so and also remember you know, christianity yeah. is the white man's re re religion by the way sorry sam you wanted to say something i was going to say the other one but other one other way that it could go with malcolm x is that he could just be I know this sounds crazy, but he could end up being a, just a louder version of Louis Farrakhan, except more influential, a more influential version of him. Mm, I don't know. But then you have to look at the moves that Malcolm X was making. I think Louis Farrakhan was won and with the nation of Islam. And yeah, not yeah. yeah. an institution. Malcolm, basically, that was almost a blessing in disguise for Malcolm X of being ousted from the nation of Islam because that's forced him to think by himself and say, "Oh." Let me look at Africa. Let me look, let me look, look at these guys. Let me, let me bring these guys in. So who am I, Malcolm X, the, the man combining what I learned from the Nation of Islam, combining what I learned in prison, combining what I learned on the, on, on the streets before prison? So it's bringing all these things. I say, oh, I can now be, as I said, I am now thinking for myself now. So Louis Farrakhan is still thinking within the paradigm of the Nation of Islam. Malcolm X is like, no, I'm thinking for, for myself now. Right. You know, so, and I think that, which, which is the key thing, especially now, in today's world and so forth, where religion is sort of, it's up and down. Someone that's just speaking directly with what is happening in the world now. Okay, what is happening in the world now? I'm not pulling upon a paradigm or pulling upon a, 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 a philosophy. I'm pulling upon this is what is happening in this world that we're in, and this is how we should be reacting and working within it. So it is interesting. It is interesting, the fact that you actually did... Um, that's I don't know that, that's that's made that's made me think that Martin Luther. So Sam, what do you think about what Daniel said? That Martin, you, th you feel that because he said Martin Luther King would have been. Wait, did he say coon or did he say that he would have been viewed as a coon? <laughs> essentially, <laughs> if, if, essentially, because my logic is yeah, my my logic is that the non-violent at. <laughs> He was mocked by the young people in the 1960s. He was called the Lord because he would talk about God and they would call him the Lord in that kind of long, elongated Southern draw that he had. Because And they were mocking him essentially because he was like, yo, this guy, all he does is talk about God and Jesus and he's not really with the shits in that sense. And I think the young people of the day who are, who are becoming radicalized by what happened with Malcolm and the Nation of Islam and, uh, you know, the Black Panther Party, as I said, in Oakland in 1966 starts up. 
there's a guy called Robert F. Williams who was really out here, like I think in North Carolina, someplace with guns and all this kind of stuff. Like, there's a lot of stuff happening before King dies. Like the Black Power movement comes into order, and Martin was against the idea of Black Power because he thought in white people's minds that's going to spark a thought that's not really productive to what we're trying to accomplish here and all that kind of stuff. So I'm telling, he was moving along the line. He was becoming unpopular on both sides. So in a sense, him being assassinated helped his legacy because the longer he lived, the more he would have become kind of just a, 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 an even bigger lightning rod on both sides. You know? Um, I mean, I mean, no, 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 because, no, just because, because just as you say this, I'm like, wow, but I'm like, you may have a point. And it's a point that many people be like, what the hell are you saying? But when you just chill out and be like, the way things were going and how he always maintained that nonviolent, nonviolent, God, church, nonviolent, or nonviolent. And he saw how things were progressing through 60s, 70s, 80s, and so forth. It's a lot of black youth dealing with that stuff. So wait, wait, wait. What you're saying and what we're, we're, we're dealing with, it doesn't compute. It's not computing. Well, it's, because it's, I thought that he would have he would have shifted. I mm-hmm. believe that he would have somehow shifted from his point of view. But if he no. would never have shifted from his point of view of nonviolence, I mean, guys would be like, wait, how do we how are we following this dude? But wait, before we go, before we go, Sam, in response to what Daniel said, Sam. Sam, I'm Sam. Here. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, what's up, man? What was so, what was the question? So, so, so basically, so, so so do you agree in Daniel's notion that if Martin Luther King had lived, maintaining his nonviolent approach, he would have essentially been viewed as a coup? I kind of agree with that because um, there would have been a level of irrelevance. I mean, you got to look at people back then and people now are people of action. Like the whole concept of nonviolence is an unpop in general is an unpopular concept because. A lot of people, it's, it's not the case of, it's not a natural reaction if somebody hits you that you don't hit back. It's a natural reaction that if you hit somebody, you hit them back and you probably hit them harder. You beat the crap out of them. But but that's really the, but but I mean, the thing about it is that, that it's that. Also, the other thing too is, is it kind of gets the, he kind of like comparing it to football, he would get the Arsene Wenger approach. He had his like prime years where he had the years in Invincible, did Good all the stuff, and then late in his later years, then he's pretty much just like he's irrelevant. He's a he's a dinosaur, a relic of the past. I think he would have got a few things. I think he would have got a few more things done. He I agree there. Structure, yeah. but then again, apart from the structure. There would there still be the young the youth that would be like yeah that's like why should we listen to you? Okay, so um, let's just before we get it. So after Carmichael screamed the Black Power, MLK was done. He did it in the okay. What happened is in 1960, 1966 or 1967, there was a guy called James Meredith. He was the first black student to attend the University of Mississippi. It's called Old Miss. They still have like Confederate flags and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so he decides in his infinite wisdom, James Meredith, that he's going to go on a march across Mississippi and nobody's going to try him in 1966. He was very wrong. In the, I think the second day of his march, uh, <laughs> a white sniper shoots him. That's not funny, but he kind of should have expected it. And this caused a kind of a national shitstorm. Like, what the hell? They shot James Meredith. He was walking alone. So all of these groups, SNCC, which is the student uh, coordinating, not the student nonviolent coordinating committee, which was led by Stokely Carmichael at the time. Um, they, along with the Southern Christian Ship Leadership Council or committee, whatever it is, um, King's organization. They did. They click up with a bunch of other ones, and they go to Mississippi, and they decide we're going to walk together and finish this guy's march. I think they were walking from Memphis, um, in Tennessee, to I think the capital, um, in Birmingham or Montgomery, perhaps in Alabama. Um, 
And during that march, they get locked up for whatever reason, because they're in Mississippi and they're black. And Carmichael comes out of prison and he gives a speech in which he crowns or coins the phrase, we need black power. <laughs> and all of the young people who are joining in the march are like, yeah, yeah, black power, black power. And from that moment, as they continue their march, there's a video of Carmichael and King walking together with a white news reporter kind of guy. And he's kind of asking, like, so what What do you mean, Stokely, by black power? And he kind of goes into explains it that, you know, we need our own black political power because Carmichael was essentially a revolutionary. Not even essentially. He was a revolutionary. And King kind of goes, well, you know, uh, I don't really agree with black power. I think blah, blah, blah. Like, he kind of goes into his whole kind of, it will make white people uncomfortable. And you can't fight violence with violence is his thing. It's it's again, it's his moral imperative that even if I die being nonviolent, that is more acceptable in my mind than using a gun, which is kind of ironic because I think in the 1950s this guy had guns, but then somewhere he flipped up. So you, you, you got three for yourself, but yeah, as as soon as Carmichael was like black power. I think MLK was put in a bind because the young people were coming into a revolutionary mindset that he wasn't capable of controlling. And at the moment he wasn't able to control it, unless his campaign got gains, which, I mean, you're going to a, the American government and being like, hey, give us some stuff. We've seen how that worked in the past. I mean, it's hit or miss, so... All right, guys. Look, man, this this has definitely been a good, good, good quality discussion. I have to just thank my dudes who've been here, Sam and and, and Daniel, for coming in again. You know, remember, guys, this, this Stay Black series is just about black consciousness and so forth. I mean, we're, we're hoping to get your boy Daniel Jones in and just to get like a bit of a white perspective here, but we're really constrained for time. So hopefully we'll try and get that happening next Tuesday. So, guys... Thank you very much for being part of this. And hopefully we can maybe see you guys next Tuesday for another Stay Black series, guys. So thank you, guys. Thank you.